Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unfiltered Productions. Today I have, um, the, uh, my name is Sherry Teague, and I'm the Ampersand and Cornetian Craft, and I have Sydney Craft with me again today. Um, we're talking about utilization of clinical resources in home health. Um, wanted to just get started off, Cindy, with the expression that we hear um, many times, and I know as a PTA, with you being a PT, you would never do this to me, but there is that um, sensation of having a patient dumped on you, quote, unquote, dumped. Um, so I figured I'd start off with a, with a really uh, touchy word uh, selection so that people to grab your attention. And um, just want to ask you the first question, why is clinical re resource utilization so important? Well, especially in PDGM, um, and I would say even in the, the model prior to that, we were not being paid per visit to manage our home health patients. We were being paid for an episode of care and how we utilize our variety of disciplines and providers has always been an important piece of effective patient management. Um, we have to be very careful. We're not saying anything about withholding visits or don't give patients visits. The issue is we have to be more strategic and intentional about what services we're ordering and what we're doing when we're out there. This is way more than a visit numbers conversation and I think very often utilization stops there with you know how many visits per episode per discipline. We want to challenge folks to think about how am I utilizing each and every visit, regardless of discipline, to advance the care plan. Are we all on the same page with respect to what are the overriding goals and objectives we want to be able to accomplish that are specific to this patient? It's interesting, you know, that you talk about what resources you're going to utilize with the patient. It's always been about visits. It's visit, 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 visit. Well, the pandemic has shown us that there's many ways to make a visit. And then, and there's been the inception of telehealth visits with um, primary providers and outpatient providers. But in home health, that's not really hit as, as much because of the um, non-payment for these telehealth visits. Can you kind of briefly describe what, what a telehealth visit in home health would look like and, and, and uh, how, how agencies could use that to their advantage? Well, I think part of that is to evaluate what needs to be accomplished, again, specific to this patient, and does it need the physical presence of a clinician to accomplish that? And I think a lot of our education, and I know very often we uh, tightly associate education with nursing and don't necessarily see that on therapy. Um, we, we see therapy much more hands-on, and I think that's what's created some of the disconnect where therapists tend to be a bit more resistant to the idea of a virtual visit because we are very tied to I need to be hands on there with them. But all of these disciplines do a lot of education and a lot of reinforcement of education that could lend itself to a, a telephonic visit or you know, a FaceTime type video interaction. Um, the discipline to me that stands out at the front of the pack on this has always been pre-pandemic for me is speech language pathology. Um, we've said for years how we've struggled to find enough of them in home care. And then when we have one, we sometimes run them into the ground with gigantic service areas and only one of them trying to cover everything. Um, the idea where they could interact with someone over a computer and accomplish what they need to accomplish from an oral motor or cognitive perspective um, is, is exciting. And I think the pandemic has opened this up. But again, it's about intentionality. It's about framing this and saying, okay, what specifically are we going to accomplish? What is our decisioning behind this? It really shouldn't just be everybody gets, you know, video-based visits or nobody gets. And, and I think part of the challenge of framing it right now, Sherry, you touched on it, is the idea that they're not paid for. Again, we have to get out of our own way on this visit, visit, visit business because we are paid for a period of time. Yes, there are minimum visit numbers attached to that, the infamous LUPA. To be fair, I mean, let's be realistic. Our industry has had some questionable behaviors in the past. And if you could get a whole payment for a whole period of time off one visit, we know there'd be agencies out there doing one visit and cash and checks. So making these minimums um, makes sense and they're based on historical utilization. So if we don't like them, We've contributed to the data that created them. But once I've passed that lupa threshold, which is pretty low in many of these cases, then whether I go to the home again or I call them is not going to change my reimbursement whatsoever. 
So this idea that I'm going to sit and dig my heels in and I'm not doing any of this stuff until I see a per visit or per encounter rate attached to it. It literally is going to take an act of Congress to make that happen anyway. But in the middle of a crisis situation, if we look like we're refusing, CMS will just say, well, then what you're telling me is your patients don't need this and wouldn't benefit from that. So I think we need to look at this objectively and say, how do I utilize this as a tool in the toolbox to be able to maximize my impact with patients and to make good decisions about when to make an actual physical visit and maybe not just assume that's the only route I can take. I appreciate that conversation and that is higher level thinking, um, but I want to get back to this concept of patient dump. Um, the, I, I have a theory, I have a theory and a hypothesis that the patient dump actually creates an increased cost to the agency. When I owned an agency, I always wanted to do an anecdotal study that showed that the patient that was nicest and closest got the most. Um, that didn't necessarily need the most, but they got the most. Um, how, how important is it that we get the right person in the house when we are going to spend that you know, visit capital, if you will? How, how important is it that we get the right person in the house? Well, I think part of that, Sherry, is we've spent a lot of time at Cornetti and Craft and, and many organizations have looking at case management and utilization and interdisciplinary case management. I mean, my gosh, we've done so many webinars on that topic ourselves. But I think a lot of the conversation has been how do you get the nurses and the therapists to talk to each other and not enough about how are nurses talking to nurses and PTs talking to PTAs and OTs to CODAs. I think handoffs within the discipline contribute to cost because if I'm just kind of blindsided and I'm just going to be candid here very often it seems to fall to the LPN the PTA or the CODA that all of a sudden here's these patients that are tossed on my schedule um, do I have the information I need from the person who did the assessment oh go read my eval okay is there any sort of handoff process with respect to what are we trying to do and we've said on numerous occasions um, we need to get to a point where each and every visit, whether it's the physical visit or a virtual visit, the overriding goal of the provider, regardless of discipline, inclusive of the home health aid and the social worker, is what are we doing for this individual patient to keep them out of higher cost care? That needs to be the mantra on every visit. And I see a lot of senior leadership having this conversation about reducing rehospitalization rates. And then maybe we'll pull in the ones that do the admissions because you know they're writing the care plan and they, they're doing OASIS and all this other stuff. But what is that translating down to the assistant, to the LPN? And, and Sherry, you and I have talked about this. I've talked to others whose job is as a PTA or a CODA or an LPN. And they feel like they get the patients people don't wanna see or they spend half their day begging people to give them visits. So I'm talking to organizations who say they have a wait list to try to get a therapy eval done, and yet their PTAs and OTAs aren't at productivity. And they can't get to productivity if patients are not being transitioned appropriately to them. So what we wanted to do at Cornetti Craft, because this could be a whole big conversation, and I sense there'll be another unfiltered follow-up to this one, but we're putting in a survey, a, a safe survey. We're not making secret lists. We're not gonna broadcast people's names. We really want people to feel safe in talking about this issue of dump jobs or how patients are handed off within a discipline. These are not negative surveys. There are definitely opportunities to talk about the glorious, wonderful nature of how patients are handed off in your organization, but it's also an opportunity for us to get some insights about some of the reality around how our patients give in to LPNs, PTAs, and CODAs. Now, Sherry, you split it into two surveys, correct? So what's the difference between the two? We have a survey that's for uh, the leadership team and a survey that's for the clinical team. And it's gonna be interesting to see the results of these surveys, Cindy, to see if there, you know, the disconnect it, that we, we are per supposing is there is actually there in the way these things are handled. And, um, we're looking forward to the results so that we can you know, uh, customize some of our offerings to get that information out there for the most efficient way to do it that's going to save the agency money and optimize uh, profit and um, sustainability of these agencies as we go through the end of the pandemic and finally feel the impact of PDGM. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. 
Cindy, I'm going to kind of end it here since we're nearing that 10 minute mark and we like to keep these brief and on point. But please take the moment to follow the links and um, complete our survey and get your 10% off coupon for your next purchase from Pornetti and Craft. You can save that coupon. There is no deadline to use it. Um, but if you want to use it, you have it. And we should, are doing that as an appreciation for you taking the two to three minutes to complete our survey. Cindy, thanks again. And, and, and you gave me four ideas for another unfiltered production after this one. So um, away we go. Everybody have a great day. <laughs>